Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Navigating the Diagnostic Journey session. My name is Andrew Rosen, and I'm the Executive Director of NAM. Before we get underway with introducing our speakers, I want to mention a few housekeeping notes. Please remember to ask questions at any time. Just use the chat box you see below. We'll have our speakers available after the presentation to answer those questions. We will have a short survey at the end of the session and would appreciate if you could take just one minute to give us your feedback. Also, if you are missing one of the talks happening at the same time as this one, don't worry. We will have all the sessions available for on-demand viewing at the end of the day. Check the videos on demand link on the side navigation of the event platform. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Dr. George Chip Wilmot. Dr. Wilmot received his medical degree and PhD from the University of Michigan, did a neurology residency at Emory University, and then remained at Emory as faculty in the Department of Neurology. He is currently most active in clinical research in ataxia. He is a member and past leader of the Cooperative Ataxia Group, a member of the Clinical Research Network in Friedrichs Ataxia, and started the Cooperative Ataxia Registry, a patient-based registry for those with ataxia. We also have Matt Bauer, a genetic counselor at the University of Minnesota in both the Ataxia Clinic and the Molecular Diagnostics Laboratory. He has had the privilege of working with countless Ataxia patients and families over the past 20 years. During this time, he has been involved in the development of new diagnostic technologies for Ataxia patients, and he regularly speaks at local Minnesota NAF events. Welcome, Dr. Wilmot. Take it away. Hi, this is Chip Wilmot. I'm going to be talking to you this uh, today about navigating the diagnostic journey of ataxia um, through the neurologist perspective, what we think about as neurologists. Um, just want to disclose that I do work for some pharmaceutical companies with uh, on a consulting basis and uh, that we're, I'm going to talk as a neurologist and not really touch at all on the genetics perspective. I'll leave that to Matthew Bauer, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So this is the way that doctors think. We get people coming in and we have to decide on what they have and how to treat it. And this is just an example case that I'm gonna, going to use to um, lay out what we think of as the diagnostic journey. So suppose that there's a man who comes in, he's 55, and he has some gait imbalance, and we examine him, and there's some imbalanced gait, uh, some difficulty walking tandemly, which means putting one foot right in front of the other, kind of like walking on a tightrope. What we think of is what is the diagnosis? And, um, that's not necessarily an easy thing to establish. First of all, the problem might be that we don't even know that it's ataxia. So if we examine that patient and then we say, you know what, there are cerebellar problems, there is actually ataxia or incoordination in the limbs, then we can establish more directly that it is definitely ataxia. This might seem like a minor point, but in fact it's not. As neurologists, we're referred patients who have some difficulty with balance and walking, and they've been labeled as ataxia, but they really don't meet our definitions of ataxia. And it's important to treat them a little differently. If they have Parkinsonism, for instance, and Parkinson's disease, we would be thinking differently. And this talk is really just going to talk about people who really have ataxia. And again, I bring this up because some people watching this might have been labeled with ataxia and might not be. Most, the vast majority of people um, will be. So I wanna just relate to you what the medical workup kind of is. As we go to medical school, we learn to be doctors and it comes down to the history, the exam, and then we come up with an assessment and plan. And in the history, it's really a story of the patient. What symptoms did they have? At what point um, we can include studies in that portion? You know, the, the story 
the medical story is not just the patients, it is the patients, but the story also includes information like what were the past results that other doctors um, got on their tests. And that will influence what we will need to do. So we need to know about that. Um, we also find out about other diseases, past medical history, we call it. Medicines, uh, good medical history of, of medicines that somebody is taking. Habits like drinking, um, other kinds of uh, smoking or drug use or exposures. And then family history, which I'm not going to talk about because um, Matt Bauer is going to do that. Um, and let me just stop right there and say that as patients, you greatly facilitate the evaluation uh, of a doctor by bringing in records yourself. A lot of times we get patients who say, oh, my doctors, my previous doctor said that he would send that. Well, that might be true but we might not have access to it and it slows everything down. I really think unless you're told otherwise, um, always having records with you and getting copies of records and keeping them with you as you see different doctors is really helpful to make the process of diagnosis, that diagnostic journey more efficient. Also for Imaging, MRIs, it's really helpful if we actually have the images. Now, you might have a very good MRI and you were told that it was normal, and maybe you even have a report saying that it was normal. Um, I, as a neurologist and ataxia specialist, I'm not necessarily going to trust that report. I want to see with my own eyes what it looks like. If I can't, Maybe we would have to order another test. Not always. Um, sometimes we can go on that information, but we like to see the images if we can. Next, you know, when after you're done giving a history, um, and as a neurologist taking that history, you have to examine uh, the patient, and we're looking for particular signs. So symptoms are what you experience as a patient. Signs are what we see as doctors and their abnormalities in the physical exam, for instance. And we're looking for things like eye movements, the degree of ataxia. We're also looking for stuff like um, drop in blood pressure when you stand up, um, abnormal muscle contractions, certain kinds of tremor, reflex changes, all of those things um, that happen in the neurologic exam help guide us to, in our thinking about what diagnosis um, of ataxia you really have. And then we're going to take all that information and come up with an assessment. Um, you know, I think it's this type of ataxia, or I have no idea what type of ataxia it is. We need to do this. And that's the plan. The plan for treatment, the plan for further diagnostic studies, um, the plan for um, follow-up. Those are all critical uh, in the medical workup. So let's go back to that case. Um, so I said that we've established that this is ataxia. We did that by a good exam, not just hearing the history of gait imbalance or maybe even in coordination. That still might not be truly ataxia, but when we examine the patient, we've defined it's definitely ataxia. And what kind of ataxia is it? Because there's a lot of subtypes. Ataxia itself refers to those diagnoses that have this incoordination, gait imbalance, often slurred speech, um, as their predominant symptom. But what kind of ataxia? What subtype? And that's our job, and that's very difficult at times. This is a slide from that I show my, the medical students and the residents because this is kind of how we as ataxia specialists think of ataxia. The diagnosis we would divide up into either acquired conditions or inherited conditions. The acquired conditions might be secondary. For instance, if you get a stroke of your cerebellum, you might be ataxic. Um, if you have nutritional deficiencies, you might be 
ataxic from those. Um, and then there are other conditions, the primary acquired ataxia is where the ataxia is really the main thing. And um, we need to try to figure out why that happened. There's no real obvious proximate cause. We have a couple of those. There's a number of them, actually. I've listed a few here. Idiopathic late onset cerebellar atrophy is, or iloca, is kind of just a grab bag term when we can't figure out what else it is. Um, we think that there might be some acquired conditions that are degenerative in the brain, neurodegenerative conditions that affect the cerebellum that give you ataxia that are not going to be positive on other kinds of testing, kind of like um, acquired Parkinson's disease, for instance. There's also multiple system atrophy, which is just another diagnosis that um, has particular features. Um, and then other kinds of, of ataxias where they're more autoimmune or, or other things. And don't worry about the specifics here. Again, I show this with a lot of extra information of specific diagnoses because that's what we're having to think of. And I want to give you a little window into the view of the neurologist as we help guide you on the diagnostic journey. There, there's also ataxia that is inherited, sometimes with a family history and sometimes not. When there is a family history and it's a primary ataxia, meaning that we really, um, ataxia is the main thing, we divide it up in ter terms of the inheritance pattern, either autosomal dominant, recessive, or X-linked. Um, and the other kinds that are secondary, really what I'm thinking of is something like maybe Tay-Sachs disease, where most of the problems are not ataxia, but there can be an ataxia component. Many of those patients would be seen by other doctors, not the specific ataxia specialist. But the primary ataxia is where ataxia is the main thing. We get referred these patients. Um, spinocerebellar ataxia refers to the dominant ones. And we're up to SCA48 now, and there's a few others that aren't named. So there's a lot of, oops, a lot of ones to think about. In autosomal recessive ataxia, some of them have other names, and they're crazy names. This would be Friedrichs, for instance, and um, uh, inherited vitamin E deficiency and other things. And there's a bunch of them. And then there's nomenclature is always an issue how we label these things, what name we attach to them. And the more recent thing is to call the, the recessive one SCAR or um, spinocerebellar ataxia recessive. And I'm not going to get into you know, the definitions of dominant and recessive uh, here, but just su suffice it to say, there are lots of things that we have to think of, not only for acquired, but also for a uh, inherited ataxias. Um, so how would we make a diagnosis of an inherited ataxia? Um, we'll talk also about the acquired ataxia. Um, but for the inherited ones, um, I'm not going to get into any of these specifics, but there are phenotypes. Patients look like something, right? They have and actually, this kind of applies to the acquired ataxias, too. Some ataxias look a certain way. The eye movements are, some, are a certain way. The blood pressure control has certain features. The muscle control beyond just the ataxia has certain features. For instance, the muscle tone is very elevated, maybe with cramping, indicating maybe spasticity. And um, we can apply those um, we can apply those phenotypes, which just means what a patient looks like, you know, what their features are, um, to help guide us in our journey to establish a diagnosis. Again, this works for acquired forms to some degree, and it also works for the inherited forms. And for SCA, for instance, this is just a table I grabbed off the internet, um, but contains information that most of us, you know, ataxia specialists deal with all the time, helping to guide us in the uh, workup 
of acquired uh, and inherited ataxias. So what is my diagnostic approach? When a patient comes in, that 55-year-old man, or maybe case two, you know, the 17-year-old woman, or the 98-year-old man with, you know, lots of strokes or something, I'm going to consider what they look like, what the phenotype is, what their exam findings are, what their medical problems are, what medications they're on. And I'm going to predominantly use all of that information to help guide my workup. But I'm going to have some certain principles. Number one, just about everybody needs to be scanned. They need an image of their brain. If we know that they are ataxic and that it is a cerebellar ataxia or ataxia that's involving the brain, we need to see what the brain looks like because the brain might have a structural lesion that will need to be dealt with, like a tumor or something like that. Um, there are rare cases where maybe we wouldn't do that when it looks exactly like it's supposed to and we know that the patient has an inherited condition. Um, but it's, it would never be wrong to um, do an image. And we would prefer getting an MRI because it gives us much more information than a, a CT scan or a CAT scan. So if the imaging just shows atrophy or it's normal, well, let's say it's normal. Does that mean the patient doesn't have ataxia because there's no cerebellar abnormalities? No, because the sensitivity of that test isn't perfect. There can be cellular changes that lead to cerebellar dysfunction that are not um, reflected on the MRI exam. So, um, and then if it shows atrophy, what does that mean? Well, it just means that the cerebellum has some sickness to it. It's, it's not happy, and there's been shrinkage of cells and maybe some cell death, and that could explain the symptoms. And we want to try to figure out why that's happening. And we need to screen for other common treatable disorders. Um, alcohol abuse, long-term alcohol abuse, um, really high use, um, can lead to degeneration of the cerebellum and it would be important to stop drinking. Certainly in those cases and in general we don't like patients with ataxia um, to be drinking uh, alcohol. It can have uh, bad effects on them. And also medications because some medications can re be responsible for ataxia and if we can identify those we might be able to stop them and make the patient a lot better. We want to check labs for treatable causes, and there's a whole list of things that we would send in almost every patient who has a normal MRI or an, uh, some atrophy there. Looking for nutritional or maybe inflammatory or autoimmune causes, an abnormal antibody, like an anti-GAD antibody. GAD is an enzyme in the body, and some people make antibodies to that and attack their own body and it cross-reacts with the cerebellum. After we send those tests for things that could be treatable, we would think about, let's check for other less common causes because there can be some obscure things. And we might think of genetic testing as well. Certainly, we can do the less common things, let's say genetic causes or some obscure acquired cause, at the same time, we screen for treatable causes if we have a good reason to. For instance, somebody with a family history, yeah, we might send the treatable causes things, but the cause is almost certainly the family history if it's known to be SCA3 or SCA1 or Friedrichs or whatever. Uh, in the family, then we would send a test for that certainly um, very early in the diagnostic journey. If there's rapid progression, it might indicate that the underlying disease is more aggressive, more invasive. You know, a cancer, a tumor, and certain kinds of autoimmune problems. And in generally, we work up more urgently and more thoroughly. Um, we would certainly do the brain imaging for the reasons that I have already outlined. And it's important to note that sometimes the MRI has some unusual 
signatures, some signals in certain areas that lead us to specific diagnoses. Um, and I get a lot of questions, is it time for me to do a repeat MRI? And in most cases, if there's just some atrophy or if it's normal, we don't need to repeat the MRI. Sometimes we will, but we don't frequently on a clinical basis anyway need to repeat the MRI because the MRI is mostly to rule out structural lesions. And once we rule those out when a patient is symptomatic, um, we don't need to rule them out again. Uh, if the MRI doesn't give the answer, then what? So there's lots of blood tests to do. Here, I left in, in this slide for medical students and residents some of the things that we might send. Don't worry about what those are. A spinal tap is optional. Uh, the reason the MRI and blood tests are in um, orange or yellow there is because they're almost always done. The spinal tap isn't always done, but would be done for something that's more rapidly progressive or more likely to be... Um, uh, a inflammatory condition, for instance, and sometimes it will be done in other cases, but, but certainly not all of all cases. Genetic testing is, is often done when um, it, there isn't a clear other um, diagnosis, as it should be, because sometimes you really need to rule out those genetic causes, and I think uh, Dr. Bauer will be talking about that more later. Um, electrodiagnostic testing, nerve conduction studies, EMGs, electromyography, and EEGs are sometimes done, don't always need to be certainly autonomic testing. Testing blood pressure control, and they test sweating and other things can sometimes help establish the phenotype, which can help establish the diagnosis. And specific um, ophthalmologic or neuro-ophthalmologic testing, looking at your eyes, can give us signs sometimes that can be helpful. So let's get back to this diagnosis. Um, the diagnosis on this patient could be really anything. I mean, if there's a, sorry, if there's a positive family history, it could be genetic. If there's a tremor and cognitive change, maybe it's a fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome. If there's antibodies on our, on our lab screen, it might be anti-GAD associated ataxia. Or if there's a lot of Parkinsonism and autonomic features, maybe it's multiple system atrophy type C, where C stands for cerebellar. Um, and, but a lot of patients, we do the workup and we don't find anything. And we can just label them idiopathic, which means we don't know, basically. Um, but we want to continue, as we see that patient again and again and again, to evaluate the diagnosis. So, in summary, um, there's many diseases causing ataxia. I threw up some on some of those slides, but the actual things that we think of or have to know about are actually much higher than that. Um, and some of the, the diseases can be, um, might be treatable, including even, you know, some, some inherited forms. So, the reasons for genetic testing, um, you know, used to be that we would you know, say, well, we don't know if it'll lead to treatment. And we don't know that it leads to treatment now, but there's enough reason to be excited by that, that we want to really expend a, a good bit of effort establishing a diagnosis, even if it's genetic, because of possible possibilities for treatment or inclusion in, uh, in, in drug trials, which are ongoing or being uh, planned right now. The phenotype, what somebody looks like, what their features are, can help diagnosis but there's so many things that overlap. A lot of times, especially for genetics, we just got to screen for a lot of things. So it might seem like on your diagnostic journey, you're getting a lot of tests um, or that lots of things have been looked at. That's just necessary a lot of times, unfortunately, because this is complicated business. And finally, you know, the correct diagnosis is critically, well, is very important. We, we always want to do it. It can give so much benefit in terms of getting an answer and the psychological benefit that that creates um, in terms of potentially treatment. Um, but a lot of times we go through this journey and we come out and we're still kind of uncertain of exactly what ataxia it is. And I want you to know that that is very common and it's not wrong. It's just a side effect of the complexity of ataxia. Um, so um, if it is uncertain, continue to walk down and navigate that diagnostic journey. But 
if you've been worked up very well and it still isn't known, don't don't get overly anxious about that. It is a, a common thing. Um, I think that's my last slide. And um, I want to thank NAF for inviting me to be part of this presentation. And um, now we're going to turn it over to Matthew Bauer, who's going to be talking about the um, genetic aspects of navigating the diagnostic journey in ataxia. Thank you. Welcome to the genetics portion of navigating the diagnostic journey. Uh, my name is Matt Bauer, and I'm a genetic counselor at the University of Minnesota's ataxia clinic. And um, I work mainly in our molecular diagnostics laboratory doing genetic testing, but I also have the privilege to work in our um, ataxia clinic where I get to meet all of our fantastic new patients who come in to see us. Um, and disclaimer slide, um, these are the standard disclaimers. I have no significant disclosures. Other than one quick informal disclosure that this is about a 15 minute talk, I'll be giving a very high level overview of the genetics diagnostic journey, um, but I'm not going to be going into a lot of details about all of the different types of genetics ataxia. All right. So where are we in the journey at this point? Um, usually by the time you meet with somebody like me, you've already met with a neurologist. Uh, they may have done a few tests like an MRI and some blood tests. And together in your conversation with the neurologist, you've decided that you want to investigate or at least discuss investigating a genetic cause of your ataxia. And this may be because the neurologist suspected this could be a genetic diagnosis or it might be because you have a lot of questions or your family has a lot of questions, but for whatever reason, you've decided to pursue a genetic cause of your ataxia. <clears throat> so what's the first step? Well, first step is you have to meet your tour guide and your tour guide in many settings in an ataxia clinic um, might be a genetic counselor who works uh, with ataxia. It may be the physician in your ataxia clinic um, in other cases, there may not be a specific genetic counselor or physician with ataxia expertise, and you may see a genetics professional um, who works in many, many different areas. Um, when you meet with a genetics professional like myself, we usually begin by asking you a lot of questions about your family. We get what we call a pedigree or a family history. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, there are medical reasons why we want to get a family history. Sometimes when we ask family history questions, we start to see a very clear inheritance pattern, or there may be other clues in the symptoms that people in your family have experienced that help us to hone in on a specific type of ataxia. And so part of the reason we ask about your family history is to get this medical information. To me though, what's equally important is I wanna hear about the story of ataxia in your family. Um, are you the first person to have these symptoms? Is ataxia sort of a new mystery in your family that no one knows about? Is it something people have known about for four generations? It's, old, it's an old story in your family. Everybody knows about it. Are people open in discussing it, or is it a family secret? Um, if we found it's genetic, who might it impact? Who might, might it impact your children, your siblings? And so I think it's, it's equally important that part of the reason we're getting this family history is to hear about your story and how genetics is going to impact you specifically. So when you think about preparing for this part of the journey, for um, preparing for a family history, um, sometimes I'll talk to people ahead of time and they'll say, well, what, what can I figure out or what should I do ahead of time? I think it's good if you're able to ask family members, has anybody had similar symptoms to you? And sometimes, you guys are probably very familiar. When you use the word ataxia, you get kind of a blank look from the people you're talking to. So not everybody's heard the term ataxia, but if you ask about, did anybody else have balance problems? Um, anybody in a wheelchair walker at a young age, people who had difficulty with speech. And so just asking people in the family general questions about neurologic symptoms. And it's also important to ask what age those symptoms started at. You know, were those symptoms present when they were young adults or maybe later on in life? And so gathering this type of information can be really, really helpful preparation for us. 
And as part of this preparation, um, asking people if there's other people in the family who've had clear symptoms that look like ataxia, asking them the specific question, did you have genetic testing? And if so, there's one follow-up question we always like to ask, can you get a copy of those results? And depending on your family, some people are very open to sharing information and records, other times not so much. But the more you can get that really specific information, like my cousin Joe had a genetic test, here's a copy of the results, it really, really helps us to, to hone in on this family history. We know that sometimes when information is passed from your second cousin to your first cousin to your great aunt to your aunt, the story changes. And so the more we can get to that original specific diagnostic information, the more accurate it is. So again, preparing for a family history, ask people about symptoms in the family, ask if they've been evaluated or diagnosed with ataxia, have they had genetic testing? And if they have, can you get a copy of those results for us to see? Okay, so you've met the tour guide. I have a good sense of what your family story is. And here's where I really wanna dig into one important question. We're talking about the diagnostic journey here. And I think we need to sort of back up and say, should I embark on this journey? And I, I put this in here because I think it's really important for patients to realize it's your decision whether or not to embark on this journey. You know, this isn't something that just because the neurologist or the resident or somebody was really excited about genetic testing that you have to go along with it. This is a decision that you make when you decide that this information is important to you. And some of the things I think it's important to think about when you are considering whether to embark on this journey, how important is it for you to have, quote, an answer or a name? Um, with genetic testing, sometimes we may be able to identify a specific type of ataxia. And for some patients, that's a really important, gratifying part of their diagnostic journey to be able to say, I have SCA1 or I have SCA7 or Friedrich's ataxia. So sometimes having that answer or that name is really, really important to patients. For other patients, it's not as important. Second point, is this information important for my children or my, my siblings? You know, sometimes I see patients where really for them, it doesn't matter so much what we call this. They know they have ataxia, they're dealing with it. It doesn't matter what type it is, but they have children, they have siblings who are concerned about their own risk for ataxia. And so one reason why people may embark on this genetic testing journey is to help to provide information to other family members. Um, the final question I think it's important to ask is, am I prepared for the answers that I might find? And above, I sort of indicated that sometimes for patients, it's really gratifying to get a name or an answer um, for what's going on. But I think also genetic information is powerful in the sense that sometimes people learn something unexpected. And so they may have believed I think I have a sporadic ataxia, nobody else in my family's at risk, and we do a genetic test and all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh, your children are at 50-50 risk. And so I think it's important to consider before embarking on this journey, am I prepared for the answers we might find? And sometimes people say, you know, not today, and then call me back in a month or two and say, hey, you know, we had a conversation in the family and we are ready to go and embark on this journey, okay? So very, very, important first point here, or second point, I guess, is should I embark on the journey? Section three of our diagnostic journey now, what might I find? So if we embark on this journey, you've made the decision, what types of answers can you find from genetic testing? And again, I'm stressing, I'm doing a very high level 30,000 foot view. I, I appreciate that here. Um, sometimes we may find an answer we may find a change in a gene that gives us a very, very specific diagnosis. AOA1, AOA2, Friedrichs, SCA1, SCA2. Um, in some cases, that answer may give us some guidance about what to expect in the future. Um, in some cases, that answer may point out some additional things we need to do for health screening. So some types of ataxia, there may be some other health complications that we need to be screening for. 
Um, if we find an answer, we're much better able to give guidance to other family members. And so if we find a very specific, clear diagnosis, we're usually able to give very clear guidance to siblings and children about what their risk is. And we're able to offer them a very targeted, accurate genetic test at that point in time. And so that's one potential kind of endpoint of the, of the diagnostic journey. We might find an answer. And that's, I think, when we embark on the journey, I think that's what we're all hoping for is to find an answer. Well, sometimes we don't find an answer. So the, the answer to the question, what might I find? Sometimes it's nothing. Um, and I think it's important to realize that if we don't find a clear genetic answer, it doesn't mean that this is not a genetic condition. We're only as smart as we are in 2021. And there's many, many more types of ataxia we still have to discover. And so sometimes the end result of the diagnostic journey is frustrating. We suspect there's an answer out there. The patient wants some information and we don't find anything clear with the testing. And I think just really being humble and realizing there's a lot we still don't know about ataxia. The final answer that we might find is sometimes more uncertainty. And I think this can be particularly frustrating because often when people embark on this diagnostic journey, what they're trying to get rid of is the uncertainty. They're frustrated, they know they have symptoms, they know there's something in the family, they want an answer. And sometimes when we do genetic testing, we find changes in people's DNA that we just simply aren't smart enough to interpret. And usually when these are on a lab report, they're called something like variants of uncertain clinical significance or variants of uncertain significance. And so some of you may have encountered these in the testing that you've done. And what these are, I think these really are a reflection of the fact that our genome is amazingly complex. We have 3 billion letters of genetic code. Each person you meet has about three and a half million differences in their genome. Most of those differences are benign but we still don't know enough about the differences from person to person in their DNA to know all of those changes, which ones can cause ataxia and which ones are just benign normal variants. And so sometimes we find these variants, we don't know what to make of them, we, they're on the report. I think it's important in this circumstance to realize when we find these variants, we're not saying this is the diagnosis, we're just saying, here's some variations in your genes that may be significant, but we're not smart enough to know, or they may be perfectly benign. And again, we're not smart enough to know. All right. So those are the types of things we might find on the journey. How are we going to travel through this genetics diagnostic journey? I've sort of ordered these tests top to bottom from sort of, in a sense, the simplest to the most complex. And the simplest type of test is a targeted genetic test. For some patients, when we go through the family history, it becomes immediately clear that we know exactly what type of ataxia is in the family. Somebody else has had a genetic test. And it's a really straightforward, quick journey because we can just say, hey, we know where to look in your genome. Let's just look there. And usually it's a pretty clear yes or no answer. Um, so I'm guessing if you guys are in a diagnostic journey breakout, you don't fall in that category because usually those are pretty straightforward. The next most complex or um, type of genetic test would be single gene tests. Sometimes we don't know for sure what type of ataxia is in the family, but the symptoms and the story really point to a single gene that's pretty unique and characteristic. And so sometimes we may decide, you know what? we think this is ataxia telangiectasia, and we're just gonna look at that one gene because we really strongly suspect that's what's going on, okay? Sometimes we can do that. Usually we are not smart enough to be able to pick and choose single genes. And so most often, I think the starting point of the diagnostic journey is some type of genetic panel. And a panel is just, it's a group of different genes that we know can cause ataxia. And so we're essentially saying, we know you've got ataxia. We're not smart enough to pick and choose which single gene. So we're gonna look at maybe a dozen or a few dozen different genes and hope that somewhere amongst those, there's an answer. Excuse me. 
One step more complex from a panel is whole exome or whole genome sequencing. And we're, um, this is really migrating or moving more into the mainstream. And what whole genome and whole exome does, and I put in quotes, is analyze all 20,000 of our genes. The reason I put that into quotes is there's still some really important blind spots. So we talk about this as a comprehensive look at all of your genetic material, but there are some types of genetic changes that we just really aren't able to do reliably from genome. A lot of the common ataxias like Friedrich's ataxia are actually kind of difficult to pick up with whole genome or whole exome sequencing. And even though we may be looking at all 20,000 genes, we still don't know what most of them do. And so we're not able to interpret all the changes we see. And so traditionally the diagnostic journey kind of started somewhere near the top of this list with really sort of targeted tests. And then we would go and cast broader and broader nets. Going forward in the next few years, it may be that we sort of bypass some of these earlier options and skip to right to whole exome and genome sequencing. But for now, we still know there's some important blind spots in there. The other important thing to realize about jumping to really complex comprehensive tests is sometimes the more places you look, <clears throat> the more information that you find that you don't know what to do with. And so that's part of the reason why sometimes we start targeted is to minimize the chances of finding things that we just simply don't know how to interpret. Okay, so what if we don't find an answer? I think it's, it's really, it's a common experience I hear from patients, they feel like everybody else knows what type of ataxia they have, but I don't. And I think it's really critical to realize it's actually quite common for people not to have a specific genetic diagnosis. We're always discovering new genetic ataxias Tests are getting better and cheaper over time. I always tell people I'm a bad car salesman because I'll tell you next year's model is going to be cheaper and better. And so it may be sometimes the best options to wait and do some more testing in, in next year or the year after. We're always discovering more genes. We're learning more about these variants of uncertain significance. And sometimes we can reanalyze the data that we've already got. Um, finally, so in summary, Genetic testing is a really powerful tool. It can find very profound, important answers, both for you and your family. But genetic testing still has some very, very significant limitations. It does not always find an answer. And my final point on this diagnostic journey is that you, the patient, is in the driver's seat. You are in the driver's seat on this journey. Um, this isn't something to do just because you feel like the neurologist wants you to do it or somebody else wants you to do it. You're in charge of deciding whether to start the journey. And it's also your decision when it's time to be done with this journey. Some patients reach a point where they feel like, you know what, we've done three, four, five, six tests. I think I'm kind of done pursuing this for now. All right. So that is my talk. Thank you very, very much for listening today. We're going to transition over to a question and answer towards the end of the session. And so I will be happy to answer questions at that time. Thank you.